Good evening, friends. Lloyd Hlitschka here. Um, just wanted to let you know that I found a few more record finds at some estate sales and flea markets today. Um, one interesting item I have come across, well, I do have a few others as well, but is this Dick Clark. It's called, oops, <laughs> it's, it's Dick Clark's 20 Years of Rock and Roll. It's on the Buddha record label, and it was a TV products uh, type album that you would order off TV back at that time. By the way, I might even be doing some um, videos documenting the songs off of the various TV product albums down the road because there are many gems on those packages, and I've always been fascinated by the, the artwork that they put on these types of records. I like on this one, for example, and this one's dated 1973. Um, I like the way they decorated it with all the historical events surrounding, you know, the first 20 years of rock and roll. You can, I don't know how clear you can see it here. I'm going to try to get whatever into the picture. It's not that easy to focus, but you get the gist of what's on it. Um, another interesting item with this album is I'm going to set this right here. There's a, a booklet that was inserted in it that also you can you know page through it. It shows the various artists, uh, artists ranging from Elvis Presley to the Beatles to Jimi Hendrix, The Doors, Beatles. I mean I mentioned Beatles already, and many of the major uh, artists of the days. Um, it's really a cool uh, little insert. There's 23 pages altogether. Actually, when you count the backs in the front, there's actually 24. Um, I like the back picture, too, of it. It's the Liberty Bell. I just noticed it. I don't know if you can see it right there. We're very clear on here. But, but the really interesting item I found with this record is one of these uh, insert one of these small uh, flexible record inserts. It's on. It's it's a clear record uh, finish. It's like a clear vinyl put over cardboard. I'm sure you've seen these. I mean, if the younger people might not know these, let alone records themselves. But um, and it was in good enough shape that I was able to archive. It's an interview. If, I'll show you the title. I'm sorry I didn't get that in there. It's Inside Stories with Dick Clark, and it is dated, I'm guessing, 1973, based on what I'm finding on the album itself for the dates. So that's how I'm going to date the, the upcoming video, um, which is going to be part of this video here, by the way. And then on the back side, there's some writing, too. You know, it shows... You probably ain't going to be able to read it on here, but... It just has a little bit more linear note descriptions on it. And I just thought it was very interesting, though, because, you know, this is probably one interview that's, I don't know if it's documented anywhere. I couldn't find anything on YouTube or online. I was looking around for it. Maybe I wasn't looking in the right place. It's, it could be out there archived already, but I couldn't find it. So I'm going to go ahead and, since I already got the 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 wave file of this record uh, ripped and saved, I'm going to go ahead and get it out there because I think it's worth sharing. He mentions many of the artists of the day that, you know, I just briefly mentioned. He goes a lot further into detail though. So, and it's about a six minute, it's close to six minutes in length for the, for his interview. But I thought it was very fascinating. And he is still considered America's oldest teenager you know, that's, I know my parents said that he was, he had that tag on him for a long time, so it's pretty cool. So, otherwise, without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Dick Clark, so see you on the other side. Hi, this is Dick Clark. You know, I got to thinking, there isn't any way I'm going to be able to ramble about the past 20 years of my life in and around rock and roll and get it done in any reasonable length of time. Too much has happened. I have so many great memories I'd like to share with you, but... One of the things people ask me most frequently is, who made their first appearance on television on one of the shows you've produced? And I'd like to share some of those memories with you. 
Keep in mind that when American bandstands started back in Philadelphia days in 1952, all the big stars came by. The Four Aces, Eddie Fisher, Georgia Gibbs, Patty Page, Don Cornell, Johnny Ray. Rock and roll? <laughs> well, Alan Freed hadn't broken that on the world yet. I remember Bill Haley and the Saddlemen. He later decided that uh, the Comets was a little more appropriate. On another day, many years later, I had a request from these gentlemen to see if I could dredge up an old kinescope of their first American bandstand television appearance. It was November of 1957, as I recall, they came to Philadelphia, complete with crew cuts and smiles and eager young faces to promote a record. Matter of fact, they had a different name in those days, Tom and Jerry. That was the first network television appearance of a couple of fellows named Simon and Garfunkel. Now, when we started the Saturday Night Dick Clark Show in New York, the network people thought it'd be a great idea if an older established star introduced a newcomer. So we got Johnny Ray to introduce a girl singer. Her father, as a matter of fact, picked her songs. He's the fellow who picked Who's Sorry Now because it was a favorite of his. Johnny Ray introduced her. Connie Francis. I once got a favor call from a famous talent manager. She said to me, could we please use this very bright, talented, shy young man? He wasn't a rock and roller, but she was sure he'd be a big star, and we booked him. And he came back many times, and he was shy and very talented, and he's still a giant. He made his first appearance on the bandstand, Johnny Mathis. Somebody else said to me, got a kid we found on a doorstep in Philadelphia. Wait till you see him. He looks like a cross between Elvis Presley and Ricky Nelson. We put him on television, and we developed a very special close, close-up shot to accentuate his sensuous good looks. We called it the Fabian shot. You know something? They're still taking Fabian shots of Donny Osmond and Mick Jagger and Paul McCartney and Alice Cooper. Now, this fellow didn't really want to do our show, but his manager was and still is a very close personal friend of mine, and I, I asked him for a favor, and they came. And they made their first national television appearance on the rock and roll dance show. Jim Morrison and the Doors. Now, this young man was a Philadelphia trumpeter. His manager thought he'd uh, sound a little more commercial if he held his nose as he recorded his first record. And he held his nose. And he knocked every teenage girl of the 50s for a loop with a thing called Dee Dee Dinah, Frankie Avalon. Now, this cocky young fellow used to come to Philadelphia regularly. He hadn't had a hit yet. He did all the record hops, but he tried hard, and he hung in there, and he finally got a hit. And another hit, and another, and another, and another. And then he came to me. We'd become pretty close personal friends by then. He said, going to switch styles, Dick. What do you think of this record? And I listened to it, and I said, oh, boy, that... That isn't what your fans expect. That isn't you. That record is never going to make it. Don't do it. wonder how many times he's sung that song since that conversation. The song was called Mac the Knife. His name was Bobby Darren, of course. Now, these four wonderful guys dragged all the way down from San Francisco to do bandstand. They were extra busy, and so were we in those days, so we taped their guest appearance for future use, and somehow or other, these things happened two days before the thing was to air, coast to coast, the tape got erased. We'd already announced their appearance. Boy, we were in a jam. So we got them together again, and we taped another segment just in time for them to make their national television debut. John Fogarty and Credence Clearwater. Now, when these folks arrived in the studio, they scared everybody. You probably don't remember the first time they appeared on the bandstand. The Jefferson Airplane. I remember having an argument with a talent coordinator of a show we did called Where the Action Is. Uh, she didn't like to book this act. She didn't want to book them. She said, they don't look like our kind of people. They're, they're, they're just not right. You shouldn't do it. And I said, how about booking them anyway? And she did. Thank goodness. The Mamas and Papas. Well, this man came to Los Angeles with big, shiny, mirrored glasses on. He, he'd never appeared on television before, and I must tell you the truth, I think he was nervous. He had a mystique about him. I remember that day he came by. That was Isaac Hayes. Oh, I saw these kids first at a reception given by a friend of mine who used to sing with a singing group. A friend told me they were great. And when they appeared on the American Bandstand for the first time, the audience went crazy. The friend's name was Diana Ross, and she was the first to ask us to present the Jackson Five. Hey, sometime when we have a little more time, I'd like to tell you about some of the other first appearances by people like uh, old Bobby Rydell, Chubby Checker, Dion Warwick, The Fifth Dimension, Bread, Loggins and Messina, Melanie, The Guess Who, Paul Revere and the Raiders, Fats Domino, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, David Cassidy, James Brown, Neil Diamond, many, many more. 
You know, we've presented over 8,000 individual performances on American Bandstand alone, not to mention a dozen other shows in the past 20 years. And I guess the answer to who made their first appearance on one of your shows would be answered easier by listing the folks who haven't. The fact of the matter is there have been a lot of folks who've been with us, and it's always a pleasure. 